G'day everyone. Day 23, ring counters and step sequences using the uh, the SCS or the four layer diode or the complementary pair that we've seen in so many of these circuits uh, in this series. So it's, uh, it's one of my favorite you know variation all the different variations you can have with these three these two transistors is one of my favorite circuits. It's it's very simple. Um, it has inherent positive feedback so it can be used to to switch on as we're going to use here. And, uh, and stay on, so it's a lot like an SCR, but it's also quite uh, adjustable. You put resistors in the various legs of this device or, or hang them off here and bias them to different voltages and you get lots of different kinds of performances. In this particular device though, we're using them essentially as a voltage controlled switch. So ignoring this electrode for a minute, we bias the base here to some voltage um, above ground. Above, We're going to ground the emitter of, uh, of the NPN. When the emitter of the, uh, the PNP gets to a point where it's forward biased, with respect to the uh, the base voltage, it starts conducting current. The uh, MPN turns on and pulls more current through the base here, turning on the PMP hard, and that then provides base current for the MPN and turns it on even harder. So positive feedback, the thing saturates, essentially acts like an SCR. It slams on until the current um, running through it is removed. Once the current running through it's removed, then the thing turns off and releases again. So it's kind of like a fuse or a, a a um, you know, sort of a one-shot kind of thing. Very simple, um, super simple too, because the two transistors just happen to, with most pinouts, are the the most common emitter-based collector pinout that you see on transistors. You can just line them up, shift them one across, and solder them straight across, and you're done. You used to once be able to buy the silicon-controlled switch as a four-leaded device uh, early in the days of electronics. Nowadays, you don't see them much anymore, but they're a fun little thing to have in the toolbox. So each one of these rectangles is, is represented by this silicon controlled switch. You've probably seen it before on my website. For example, over there, the um, the whirling Decatron emulator, as I call it, is actually constructed using silicon controlled switches. Uh, somewhere on my website, I have Decatron emulator. There we go. That's what it looks like inside. As you can see, it's built pretty much as drawn in that circuit diagram just in a radial layout and there's a little oscillator to drive it. Uh, go have a look if you're interested anyway. The, this circuit is essentially the same except, uh, well, it's driven by the rest of the circuit from day 19. Alrighty, um, how I actually implemented it was more like this. I didn't bother with a resistor here, I, I could get away without using it and I put fixed bias resistors instead of having a biasing rail that was uh, that was biasing all the cells. Uh, I just used two resistors per cell, which you know doesn't cost much. I have a whole bunch of them. How does it really work? Uh, well, that's it's kind of tricky to explain. But basically, what happens is the, uh, the positive supply here runs through two resistors. So these are just to set up to uh, not blow up this transistor when I choose to clock the in the ring and. These ones are the sum of these two are set up not to blow up the LEDs when each cell is saturated and turned on. So whichever switch is turned on, the LED will glow, and when you apply a clock pulse, the LED will extinguish because the current gets diverted away from that cell through this transistor. And then these capacitors, which go from cell to cell, will transfer um, a voltage step to the next cell. That's the tricky part, but uh, it's actually quite clever how it works. What happens is in normal operation because there's some current being dropped across this resistor when this cell is on, this point, the which is the emitter point here, is saturated almost, you know, with a couple of hundred millivolts or so from ground, and there'll be, you know, one lead voltage drop from here to here, and through this cell, this cell's obviously cut off, so this point here will be virtually at the same voltage as that, and minus a little bit for the whatever the drop is at the current. So this capacitor will charge in this direction, so this, this side will be more positive than this side. When um, a clock pulse comes in and this transistor saturates, pulls down this point towards ground, and it gets you know within 100 millivolts or so of ground when this transistor saturates, the, um, this point is pulled to ground, and so this side is quite a bit higher then. And when it's released, as this comes back up, this point will be dragged up even higher than this point. So all of the cells, if you like, recover at the same time as this rail charges back up. And there's obviously some inherent capacitance across here as the, as the transistor drops out of saturation and begins to cut off. And 
what will happen is the cell that first reaches this trigger voltage, because they've all got the same trigger voltage in the case where they're, they're all linked up to the one rail or if they're all set up with the same resistor biases, all of the cells will turn on at the same time, but the cell adjacent to the one that was previously lit will reach that voltage first because it's got this extra help from this capacitor from the previous cell that was charged because of the way that cell was turned on. So it'll give it a little extra voltage kick and it will fire next. So the transfer, the, you know, essentially the, the glow, <laughs> the, the, the onness gets transferred from this cell to this cell and so on. Um, this has some limitations. The biggest one is you have to have a way to reset it because when the thing first powers up, it's quite likely that they'll be in a random state. One will fire as the you know as the rail charges up. One or more of them may fire simultaneously. They can't because of the capacitance linking the two cells. Two cells alongside of each other will not fire together. But you can potentially have you know one zero one zero kind of things. And then when you clock it, the pattern shifts around the ring. We actually use that as a feature in this cell. Uh, in in the implementation that I'm going to show you in a minute. But uh, for counting applications or for sequencing applications, that's annoying. So what you need to do is have a way to reset the entire system. One of the easiest ways to do that is to hold the thing in clock or in reset. There's another way of thinking about it. So if you apply an extended pulse here and you pull down everything, then all the capacitor charges will eventually equalize through the leakages in the devices and through the resistances. And if you have a way of ensuring that your, your first cell is biased a little bit higher, say with another resistor through the reset line, and say a little bit of capacitance or something, some kind of timing circuit, doesn't have to be very complicated, just to ensure that this cell fires first. In fact, matter of fact, you can cheat and just cheat with the resistor, pick, uh, set up the resistances or this bias value, you can bias this cell a little bit higher so that it will be the first one to fire, except for the case where the you know, there's being transferred um, charge across with these capacitors each time for each cycle. So when everyone is off and the thing is released, the one whose um, bias voltage is set a little bit lower than the other ones will fire first as the, as the thing recovers. And that can be used as a reset mechanism as well. It's, uh, it's not particularly reliable and, you know, there's obviously noise margin issues associated with that and you need to think about the, uh, the voltage that you've got across this capacitor, each of these capacitors in the normal transferring states. That's, uh, and again, it's Ohm's law, it's not particularly difficult, it's just something to think about. This circuit simulates quite well, um, I actually have some simulations of it on my website in the, uh, the Decatron and the um, ring counter articles, that if you want to uh, grab it and stick it in LT Spice and have a play with it yourself, but um, it's just as easy to build it on a circuit board and probe it. As a matter of fact, I have here on the Crow, as you see here, we have, I'm probing one of the emitter voltages, and where you see it go low, like here, that's where the, tra the lead was actually on because this, the cell is saturated. And you'll note, just, be just prior to that, in each case where the cell saturates, there's a pulse here that, of significant amplitude. That's actually where the transfer capacitor has pulled that emitter higher during the, um, the cycle, during the, pol the transfer cycle, or the clocking cycle. So you can see wherever that occurs, immediately after you have the lead turned on and the circuit saturated. So. What I actually implemented with it, that's probably hard to see because of the junk behind it, but I implemented a star for my Christmas tree that I built um, for Article 19, I think it was. So this is the pretty much that circuit that I've, you see on the page behind. There's five cells, and as it clocks, the pattern of 101 gets rotated around the tree via the, uh, the transfer capacitors. And the rest of the tree is here. It's a bit tall, we'll have to get back a bit further. But uh, down here you have the three oscillators, all have different time constants which clock the... Um, and they're almost syncing up at the moment, but they... Uh, they control three, uh, three rails which drive through a whole bunch of diodes. You can see here there's all... each lead is driven by uh, at least two of the different oscillators to blink on and off at different rates. And um, I think they're locking up a little bit because of the voltage and the probing that I'm doing to it at the moment. But anyway, it, uh, it's a very simple way of making a sequence. Now, why is there two LEDs on here? Well, it's a question. There's five cells, right? So, and we already have that rule that you can't have two adjacent cells on. So two adjacent cells off is okay. And the thing settles down into this pattern where you've got two on and three off and that pattern gets rotated around every time you clock it. 
Now, that, that's again a sort of thing with the reset mechanism. I didn't bother building a reset mechanism because this thing's for display and having two on is not a big deal. But if you wanted to use it for a counter, you'd obviously uh, have to deal with that and organize that you only one of them ever fires at once initially and then you know, it, the circuit's quite stable from then on you can just clock the one round in the ring as you see with the Decatron emulator on my desk here it's uh, only got one lead on and the one lead goes round and round and round alrighty um, pretty simple fair bit of work to actually build something like this you can see it's uh, probably took me two and a half days on and off building the thing it's also extremely bright which my camera is having issues with but it's a cute little thing for uh, for Christmas. I probably should have made it the project for the 24th, not the 23rd, but I thought I'd make it uh, show you it a little bit early. So if you wanted to build similar Christmassy kind of things yourself, you could. At the moment it's running off uh, 12 volts. You can uh, the voltage is not obviously that important, but it has to be large enough that there's a you know, with the saturation voltages and the voltages dropped across these resistors that you've got enough voltage to guarantee that the the um, the cell transfer happens. Again, it's all Ohm's law. Um, sit down with a, a simulator or, or just probe a real circuit and turn the voltage down on your regulated power supply and you'll see when it finally stops behaving and you can measure uh, all the currents and voltages and work out why. Alrighty, um, that's about it for this one. Tomorrow, the last day. Uh, I said I was going to do some RF stuff, so how about we make day 24 some RF stuff. Alrighty, until then. Oh, and if you actually wanted to make other things, just use a 4017. This is obviously the most complicated and difficult way possible to just get away with sequencing things. If you want a one-hot sequencer, then by far the easiest way to make a one-hot sequencer is to just, you know, use a 4017. Alrighty, bye.